Salam, I am your host Aya Shabi and you are listening to I Am Nala podcast. My guest today is the grand commander of the feminist <laughs> battalion. No, it's not a title of a movie. This is <laughs> Kiki Mordi. <laughs> and how she yeah. describes her, herself on Twitter. So what does that mean? I'm really curious. It's a very funny story. It was a troll that gave me the name. He was trying to insult me. Um, and the people that follow me, he's like, you and your feminist battalion you know all you people do is talk about women's rights or whatever I can't remember but I was like there is no way you're in insulting me by calling me a commander and I was like it's grand commander to you and that was it I I just I did that a lot back in the day like when someone called me bitter they were like, like a bitter woman me and my bitter followers and so he said he Modi and her bitter lot and I was like okay that sounds like a cool name for a band and we turned it into a thing And then people started calling themselves the bitter lot um, just because I didn't want to give them the power of feeling like they have insulted me. Um, so that was just me taking back their power. That's a, that's a great start of, of our podcast today because, uh, you know, taking power from the troller and using their name. Uh, and I love it. It could be really, it could be, a, you know, your next movie. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> So Kiki, I got to know about you when we were uh, identifying as Nala Council initiatives across Africa led by young women to, to recognize the amazing work uh, you do at the Nala Summit uh, in Nigeria. Uh, and that's how we came across your work and, and we selected Document Women to be among the awardees and uh, we got the chance to, to celebrate you and your, your platform. So let me start from there. I want to start from Uh, storytelling because that's the theme yeah. of today's episode it is, it is a storytelling and you are a storyteller um, and I think our listeners will really learn a lot from your journey um, and how did you arrive to where you are today as a storyteller mm -hmm. but let's let's start from document women, women. so it's it's a platform uh, uh, to to document the stories And you also had a documentary. We'll go back to that. But as documenting female voices, why it's important? How did this platform came about? Um, first of all, I've always understood the importance of um, avoiding erasure. Um, we've seen it play out so many times. All of us as Africans, I think erasure is something that we've dealt with um, one way or the other other so heartbreaking going back to my community trying to learn about you know the my my family three generations back and there is just this gap that was stolen by colonialism and as a result of that we have faced different kinds of racism and anti-blackness and just anti-africanness in different spaces because the narratives have been rewritten just like one too many times um no one knows for sure exactly what happened One, one group of people will tell you that colonialism was important for growth. Another group will tell you we were growing as a community already, but we would never know for sure because of that erasure that happened. So I was very hyper aware of what erasure does to us as a community. And then just growing in my career as a storyteller, as a woman, I saw firsthand what erasure was doing to women. Um, And even just going back to history, just learning about the women that have done really great things and just not finding them anywhere online. Just myself as a radio presenter, just hearing news as a, as a journalist, just seeing um, news happen all the time and not hearing from the women that were also a part of the news. Um, is also very interesting because sometimes I'm in the news as it happens. Um, you know, it's one thing to report news, but it's another thing to be a part of the news to be a part of um, um, a situation where this thing has finally made it to the news. So you have like firsthand knowledge of exactly what went down and then you see how it's reported and it's just reported to favor just men and just erase the women. And so I was really hyper aware of that. Document Women started as a hashtag really. Um, someone asked the question as a, at a conference and it just hit me um we always we because i was always advocating for more women in leadership and they said you know a lot of you know you hear you're advocating for a lot of women in leadership because there aren't a lot of women in leadership but there are some women do you name them do you know them can you name them 
And I simply could not. They are just women leaders to me. They don't have names. They don't have faces. They don't have stories. And that was really a call to action for me. So I went back on so social media and just like helped uh, people just document the women around them using the hashtag. Your moms, they have interesting stories. They tell you these stories. We tell the stories. Um, and so, yeah, that's what it started off as a hashtag um, before I became empowered enough to do something about it. So so before that, let's go back to, you know, how how did you grow up and what really started to trigger the storyteller in you? You know, some people uh, go into storytelling by accident. Maybe yeah. the radio, the radio space was some kind <laughs> of accident. And some people oh, just, sure. you know, they're they're They don't have a choice but to to do it. And some other people, you know, we had also on the show who find power in their voice and now become very conscious about how powerful that and how it can impact a lot of other people as well. So let's start from the start. Uh, how did it come about? Well, mine was definitely by accident. I was never going to do anything related to storytelling or any public facing job at all. I simply wanted to be a doctor or a scientist. Um, but, you know, I had a, an unfortunate sexual harassment story that saw me drop out of university with nothing to do with my life. I was literally just loitering in school. A friend of mine was going for a radio audition and I just escorted her, really. In fact, she was shortlisted. So there were like previous auditions that I had already missed. So I had no business being there. I was just like, you know, jobless and escorted her. And when I got there... The lady, um, unfortunately, she's passed away, Cleo, blessed memory. She said, you know, like, what do you have to lose? She was not quite happy with, like, the um, things she listened to that day. And she said there was something interesting about my voice. And before you know it, I got a call back. And I grew up as a shy person who would, would wait for you to leave before... I tell you that you're stepping on me just because I didn't want my voice out there. I just thought that I was just shy of my voice. It was too deep for my young age. Um, but she just made me feel like for the first time, like that someone would be interested in listening to what I had to say. And that kind of changed my life. It changed my whole outlook on life, really. Um, and so that's how I got into radio. From radio, I, I found it super interesting, you know, all the things that you could do. Just the simple thing of me asking the person calling in on radio to turn down the volume of their radio or something. Just I felt like I was in charge. And that was like the first time ever that I felt like I was in charge of my life. Um, so I explored it a lot more. I explored everything that came with it. Social media, having a voice on social media, um, TV production, everything. I just... I was just trying my hands because I was not afraid of failing anymore. To me, I was at rock bottom. What's the worst that could happen, right? Um, so yeah, that's how I found myself in this space that I'm in, telling stories using different tools. But what did you study? Oh, I studied biochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but but I want the young women listening to know that like it doesn't mean what you study you end up doing and what you're doing is yeah. based on your on your studies. Um, <laughs> I really like, uh, you know, you, you were doing this interview and and I want to go back now to the to the actual story that happened in university, which led to you uh, mm -hmm. doing the documentary uh, Sex for Grades. Um, that you said, you know, in, in the university, you didn't feel you're an, an authority of things. But in the yeah. show, you're running the show, you're running the exactly. radio show. And, and that is a powerful, uh, uh, you know, contradictory between the space of learning where we're supposed to have authority of our, you know, learning yeah. journey. Um, so what, what happened exactly in university uh, that led you to do the documentary? And maybe then you can talk a little bit about the documentary. All right. Um, so I, I have, I can't believe I'm talking about it as often as I am now, because it was a thing that I deleted completely from my life a couple of years back. But yeah, um, I, there is a thing that happens in many universities across the world, but I found just speaking to my own experience and my country that it's very normal, so normal, um, that we often expect it um, at universities, lecturers, demand for sex in exchange for grades like it's it's very normal it's part of the things that your parents will tell you when they're sending off you off to school be careful stay away from lecturers don't be too noticeable I did all of that I wasn't too noticeable I had what three friends in total 
Um, but that didn't work. Um, I found myself being harassed for a full year um, by a senior lecturer in my school, my university who had absolute control over my grades. And that messed with my mental health for a long time. It messed with my self-confidence. It messed with so many things. It was so bad that I eventually did drop out of school. I dropped out of university and it was like my dreams were crushed and I was just going to go back home and think about, I just have a think of how I want to restart my life. And mind you, this was at the age where many of my colleagues, many of my mates were graduating, you know, thinking about masters and it was not a pretty period for me. Um, I was very, I was stripped of my very, very autonomy just to simply go and get an education. Do you know how ridiculous that is? Like, what did I want to do? I wanted to go learn. I wasn't asking for too much, was I? Um, so yeah, it was a really, really dark period in my life. And it was just that space where obviously I found myself, you know, um, on radio. I found myself just taking control of my life some way. As a matter of fact, my first job on radio was unpaid, but it was just that semblance of control that was enough for me at the time. Um, and, and then I just, I felt, well, this is a new path that I could grow. And then I started to grow that path. And what was it seven years later or thereabouts? I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how many years. I mean, it's been 10 years right now. So, um, I mean, just along the line, I think there was one thing I was passionate about, which was women's rights. And obviously that you would understand why, why that would be because I felt my rights stripped away from me in real time. And when I figured that I could be empowered enough to say something, I remembered myself in that space where I had zero power, zero empowerment, zero autonomy. The one thing I wished was that there was someone else there, out there, because it was such a lonely, extremely alone feeling. So when I got the sense that I had some semblance of power, no matter how little, I decided that I'll use my voice to just be that one person that I wish I had. Um, and so I did that for a very long time. And I wasn't, you know, that empowered anyway. I didn't have like thousands of followers. I just had one, uh, what, hundreds. Um, it felt big to me. It was, it was a long way from zero. So I used that. Um, and continue to actively speak on women's rights, speak against um, sexual abuse, against grooming, against sexual assault on the radio shows that I did, on social media. Um, and this was how I and, uh, and some women like me built this community that became a safe space for a lot of young girls on social media, especially on Twitter in Nigeria. Um, and it was because of this community, actually, I was able to find myself in investigative journalism. It was the most inspiring thing, really. I was simply a nobody on Twitter who people started to notice, um, had a voice or was really passionate and willing to speak up for as many women as possible. And so um, when I met this journalist at the BBC, um, who said that this is what they're trying to investigate. I was like, well, I have a personal experience. I will tell you for a fact, and not just that I have a personal experience. I, I know an army of women who have had similar experiences and are just trying to make their way through life. Um, and that was it. That was just an immediate click and connection for me. It was like my life's mission, you know, um, it was like finding you're playing a, a video game and you you have one life mission and you find it and that was it for me it was an instant click um it was a rigorous process going from research investigation production and publication it took all of a year plus um it took a lot from me <laughs> it took um, me being honest with myself for the first time it took me being my most vulnerable it took me telling my own story and seeing how that might help other people tell their own stories as well it took me just taking myself back to that place that ugly place that I had erased from my memory for a very long time and just confronting my past um, it took a whole lot from me uh, but I'm so glad that we made it 
simply because of the effect that it's had in real life. And we're, we're talking now, I mean, you said from zero to 100 followers, we're talking now 120,000 followers, <laughs> right, on Twitter. And I think this is, um, which is my next question, is really the lessons you learned, because a lot of the, you know, young women storytellers or, or bloggers, you know, anyone now can open a blog and tell their story online, mm -hmm. uh, think that overnight, you know, that voice can impact people or that story can reach other people or everyone yeah. now start the hashtag and think like they started the movement but i think mm -hmm. what you are saying is really important that you spend over a year and a half actually shooting a documentary uh, yeah. it took a, a lot of toll on you to even tell your own story so it's it's a process from zero to 120 uh you know community i would say not just followers of people who are really engaging with your content it's it's not overnight so what lessons have you learned and what lessons you can share with young storytellers who are really trying to make impact online i think that the number one thing that i had the privilege of that a lot of young people do not have anymore is just this ability to ask questions and learn on the go unfortunately there's just a hostile environment where people expect you to come pre-programmed with all the knowledge necessarily necessary for um, activism or for advocacy. Um, I wasn't always a feminist. I wasn't always, you know, this person that I am today. I was able to learn, ask questions and grow. And I think that to the best of my ability, I tell like my mates and my colleagues that we need to provide a safe space for younger people to be able to do that and come, you know, within themselves and learn and grow just in safety. Um, because a lot is at stake for women anyway. We can't be contributing to that hostile environment. Um, we have to create a safe space for learning. Um, and so what I would advise uh, younger people that asking questions is never a problem, even though that it's been made to look like a problem right now. Um, I would say find a safe community. You don't have to bear yourself out there completely. Um, it's a good thing that tech companies are taking initiatives. For example, Twitter now has a thing called Twitter Circles. Build your inner circle, a group of women who you completely feel safe with, you know, and commune with yourselves. Ask questions, learn, grow. And don't ask questions, obviously, from a malicious place um, because that's a different thing. You have to ask questions from a place of wanting to learn and grow and adapt. And don't be afraid of being wrong. Um, you can't always be right. And, and for the people that think that I'm always right, I'm certainly not always right. Um, don't be afraid of being wrong because you can't change or you can't you can grow from a place of always being correct, always coming correct, always being perfect. Um, and... I think there is a level of confidence that comes from rigorous research. Like I said, it took us over a year to put out this documentary. Nine months out of that was dedicated to research alone. And so when things like lawsuits, you know, arise, I'm not even perturbed. It's something that I don't have to think too much about it because I am completely and earnestly confident in the work that we did. Like you can wake me up from sleep and speak a foreign language and I know exactly what happened. I lived that life for a year of my life. So I know ex exactly what happened. And so there is just that confidence that comes from knowing that you did your rigorous homework, you did the rigorous research. Um, because of how fast the internet is, just that um, temptation to want to be the first to break news is there. But it's not how fast I would always say is how well. You have to be the one breaking it down. Like document women, for example, sometimes you see someone tweeting something, there is no source. And I'm speaking to my writers, so oh, we need to cover this story. And they're like, oh, we need to hurry up. I'm like, where, where, what is our angle? Because we're not like every other person. We are document women and we're looking for the women in these stories. So let's look for these women, reach out to them, tell their stories, tell this, retell the story but prioritizing the woman, retell the story factually, making sure that we're not making the same mistakes that everyone is making because they're in a hurry to go out and post. Um, so yeah, um, that is uh, something else I would advise young people. Again, back to community, please do not underestimate the importance of community. I may look like a one woman army, a grand commander on social media, but that's simply not true. I am here because I have an army 
of women standing by my side that are just there to ride for me every single second. So do not underestimate the power of the connections that you're growing today. You guys will grow together in 10 years time. They will become your cabal. You know, the men's club right now that we're finding it difficult to hack into, you can create your own. It's not easy to hack into my cabal right now because I know I've known those women for 10 years. We've been through everything. They're my blood, you know? So do not underestimate that power of community. I'll, I'll pick up on the on the last one because of course there is um uh, the personal story and the story where you 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 tell it yourself I also in 2011 started a blog and I was so pissed of international media covering uh the movement in Tunisia and how they portray the revolution as the Arab Spring and I'm like no that's a western mm-hmm. narrative the revolution of dignity and so on so there is that one voice where especially uh in a country where uh you know uh, English is our third language so not many people would uh, challenge international media in, in that language 10 years ago. But there is also the collective, right? What, what you are talking about. Uh, and in Nala Feminist Collective, we always say that together we have more influence and we're much more in numbers. And that's where we can move things faster and accelerate things. And I know you're also part of uh, Femco. So tell us more about also the collective. So moving from the one story and where we can have find power in your own voice and raise it. Yeah. And become confident and then when you go into a collective and you create that support system hmm. yes feminist coalition one of the best things that happened to me as an adult um again i know a lot of people were in awe of how um things played out when the feminist coalition first went public and organized i also was in awe and i'm i'm inside <laughs> Because I've known these women, um, like I said, we started, most of us, you know, many of us right now are like company founders and whatnot. 10 years ago when we were just on Twitter, we were just using our very small voices with a few hundred followers to just band together and support a woman who has been, you know, who has come out to out an abuser and is now facing fire, for example. We provide some sort of safety, just full, small resources. We didn't have a lot of money. Just little money, even if it's to get a a hotel for a day, see if we can find a pro bono lawyer. We've been doing this for a very long time. I say Feminist Coalition has been Feminist Coalition for a very long time. We just made it official. Um, And so, I mean, it made sense that when um, the founders, Dami and Odun, decided to pull women together, you know, they strategically looked for women that had strong suits in different spaces. But like, it, it wasn't just about what these women, you know, are strong in. It was really just pulling from, from within the community that they have known for a very long time. And like, if you go back, you know, with everybody in Feminist Coalition for like different events, you see that we have interacted in one way or the other. So this was really just, you know, architecture at work on the on the you know from on the side of uh, the founders I really do applaud them for them for that for finding these Lego pieces these strong Lego pieces and bringing them together as somebody who is inside I mean oh I'm such a fan (laughs) so um when we had to go public during the NSAS protest that happened in Nigeria it was really a test of everything that we've been doing all our lives. It was like, you have been training for this moment all your life. Um, and it came really seamless to us. We would, the, the, I, lo- I love the word organizing because that's truly what we were about. Um, there's so many things that would, that you would require to uphold like a protest for that long. Um, and there is organization at the center of everything there is sustaining. Um, what are the things we need to sustain? We need a clear communication plan. We need a way to reach everybody. And so we did that. We created cluster forms for people who wanted to protest. Again, many of what we don't do everything ourselves. People want to do all these things and we want to be the ba- want to be the ones banding them together to do it. People want to donate. People want to um, protest and people need donations. And so we did that. We... We're very, oh 
oh my god <laughs> we're very um and of course we understood the importance of documentation everyone that reached out we used tech tools because we have tech founders among us we used tech tools to make sure that they had an easy way and ease is also part of it we had they had an easy way to apply for funds they had an easy way to communicate with other people who wanted to join them they had an easy way to um get access to help like first aid all of that um I will not underestimate the importance of tech actually in the work that we did and not complicated tech, you know, simplified tech that is accessible to every single person. You don't have to be a computer engineering graduate or whatever to be able to access like a simple notion form. You just click and it's simple English, like very simplified um, steps to take. Um, and so for the first time we were able to see a magnified version of what we've been doing for a very long time. And we flew very close to the sun, <laughs> even though we're still alive, we're not burned. Um, because we just knew that we could do it and we were not wrong. We really could do it. And we did just that. We live in a patriarchal society where patriarchy is the order of the day. It was really something seeing Nigerians in mass call out to people who they are referring to as feminists and not in a derogatory way. Because every time I've been called a feminist, a battalion leader, a, <laughs> a grand commander, or a bitter woman, it was, you know, under the um, guys that feminism is all these things. And it was really humbling to see that we were able to change that narrative, even though it was for a short period of time. Well, I mean, th that's a good way to to transition to my next question, which is really around gender. Um, what do you think the difference between male storyteller and female story storyteller, especially, well, both in document women and, you know, how do you tackle that? I'm sure you engage a lot with men, but also yeah. in the movement, right? Even when, especially when the movement is uh, obviously led, supported as many movements in history, the women, the young women are on the front line, uh, yeah. but there is always a challenge, you know, on, on a daily basis in organizing in our ways of storytelling that is uh, very much dismissed. Um, so how do you deal with that, both in the only women movement space, but also in a space where, uh, like Ansars? Um, I think the difference between like a male storyteller and a female storyteller is privilege. Um, as a storyteller, I'm fighting for my life. I'm fighting for my preservation and the preservation of many women like me. Um, a, male a male storyteller is simply telling a story, which is not a bad thing. Um, when I say like, when I say privilege, um, some men think like this is an attack. That is what it should be as a matter of fact. As a woman, I simply want to tell stories. I don't always have to fight. I don't like fight. I like ease too, you know? <laughs> I just want to wake up and not think about oppression and do my job. Um, unfortunately, that is not my reality. Um, and so I try to get men to understand that you are coming from a place of privilege as a storyteller, and you could be doing so much more, especially if you claim to be an ally. Being an ally is not just, oh, I acknowledge that women are disadvantaged and stopping there. Unfortunately, it means that you also have to put in some work. You have to put down your click of privilege and get your hands dirty and actually do some work to bridge that, like some equitable steps. You have to take equitable steps to bridge that gap that exists right now. And so this is a challenge that I face daily. Um, working with women, I try to uh, um, let women understand that you're fighting for your life. We're not playing here. <laughs> Um, you have to do this, you have to do this for your survival and for the survival of your kids. Well, not like not your literal kids, because think about how many how many of your grandmothers have been erased. You are on the path to erasure already. So we're course correcting and it's, it's really hard work. Um, some of the things you may not immediately feel, some some spoils of oppression you feel like really easily. I mean, with things like marriage rights or widowhood rights in some communities in Nigeria, that one is very visible and you can see. Some you can't see until it's too late. And erasure is one of those things. Um, so I try to open their eyes to what the reality is, what the numbers are saying. And it's not so hard for women to adapt. 
um, for men, there is just that constant reminder working with men. Um, I've worked with men, even under document women, and every day I have to remind them what we're doing here. This is what we're doing here. It's important. I know you know what we're doing here, but you need to internalize it so bad that that is your default. Um, you need to think like me as essentially um and you need to ask yourself the question how do i document women and another, another thing i say to journalists a lot in nigeria is that your story is not complete without a female source and it sounds really like what the hell is that about but when you look at the number of women that are cited as sources um is dire is ridiculous well i don't know women in the world don't they have mouths don't they have opinions um, and journalists, you know, always hit me back with oh, women don't like talking to journalists. And then I ask them, I wonder why. Why do you think women don't like talking to journalists? Like, think about it. You know, just go through history. Look at your own publication. Look at the last um, front page story you had about a woman. How was it framed? Um, I'm a journalist and I don't like talking to journalists because they take my words out of context. Like, they're very, they, there is no duty of care for me. Um, I was getting harassed constantly by a, a, a man on social media. When we say a lot of things, I see the kind of things that are picked out from my words. And I see the kind of things that are picked out from his words. The ridiculous parts are ignored when he says things like, or oh, I'm a something, something, I take birth control. Like he says ridiculous things that are, nice and juicy for headlines. They don't make the headlines. What makes the headlines is when he says something that is remotely profound. When I say something, you know, everybody is human. Everybody gets emotional. When I say something, they find like the, the darkest and the most ridiculous, most emotional moment and amplify those instead. And so I do not like speaking to journalists. And I, tell, I told the journalists, if you're doing a story on engineers, and you have to go speak to engineers. Um, and then you say, oh, the engineer did not, the first engineer did not speak to me. You're not going to stop there because your story is incomplete without speaking to an expert or an engineer. So you would continue finding until you find one engineer to speak to. And so that's simply it. If we just have that ideology that we're simply not having a balanced source if we do not have from a man and a woman maybe we will start to see a lot of our stories as incomplete. I, I love what you said about, um, you know, not your story is not complete until it has a female source, but also what you said about safety and really creating, um, creating that safety because people assume that telling stories is, is easy. You go online and, and, and you do what you do. In your, um, uh, especially in the documentary and other pieces that you did as investigation, well, what was maybe the most dangerous moment or the moment where you're like, what am I getting myself into in the storytelling work, you know? Um, and, 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 and also some, and maybe from that, the lessons learned and the tips to uh, aspiring females, especially in this industry and in this space who might think, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to go for it without the expectation of the, some of these challenges that are not only challenging patriarchy, but also the safety side. It's, it's literal safety. It's, survival it's people life on the line for for some of these um uh, especially investigative uh, journalism oh wow <laughs> i think the most dangerous i've ever been in i don't even know if I, 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 that didn't make it to that hasn't that wasn't published anywhere i <laughs> definitely have taken a lot of stupid risks and i think there is no talking young people out of that especially when they are hungry and passionate they would want to do the hard <laughs> you know it's just it's the passion when you have a when you have these hopes and all these dreams you would want to put yourself in situations but guess what if i had died well, who would have done you know the project that i later ended up doing right um just the good thing about working with organizations like um, the bbc is that you you get to see some commitment to safety um you speak but they have the budget so like uh, what are, what are you going to do as an individual you don't have the budget um but the truth is you don't have to always put yourself in compromising positions to to make a difference i know that even before we had this um 
you know, relatively big budget um, um, documentary. We've done like smaller things that have had like s- smaller impacts as well. Um, and I think that it helps to talk to someone um, just to reset. Personally, the person that, res- that resets my brain is my mom. I wouldn't talk to my mom. I wouldn't advise you to talk to my mom because my mom is overtly, do not do it. <laughs> if it was left to my mom, to be honest, I wouldn't do any of the things that I do. Um, but it really helps you, like, because when you're just driven by this passion, sometimes it's like madness has fallen over you and you have no sense of safety for yourself. It really helps you stay grounded when you tell someone you love what you're doing. They're able to like properly advise. You might not take their advice, but it just brings you back to earth a little. Um, uh, you can't work alone for sure. I think people just uh, as a as a basic, you have to have someone you trust who knows your whereabouts at all times. Um, there's different things on your phones you can use to share your location at all times. Make friends with law enforcement uh, because you are to collaborate with them. And to be honest, that's such a hard ask, especially for a Nigerian woman. Law enforcement really just structurally is not your friend. <laughs> It's so bad. It's so unfortunate. And I truly hope that this is the, the generation that changes it. But, you know, I, you, we really do need them. You need documentation of all the steps. Um, If you feel like something bad is about to happen to you or someone is following you or you're being stalked or anything, you have to report. Uh, bearing in mind that you also have to take uh, personal safety, but you have to report for documentation purposes. The good thing about reporting is that if someone else reports, it just brings more visibility to whoever this dangerous person might be. Um, and it might be like ground zero for working. It might be, you know, what another person who might be more empowered to expose them needs. Um, also, I think you should research on people who have done what you've done before, especially people who have tried and failed. So you can see where they failed and you can see how you can work through their failures. Um, Yeah. Just be safe. I cannot exhaustively tell you everything you can do to be safe. It's a lot. It's expensive. It's not easy, um, but it's doable. It's Mm. extremely doable. You just have to be hyper aware of your safety. Mm. I think the the advice on reporting is is extremely important because sometimes, especially as women, we say, why report when I'm not getting justice? But at least, yes, you can bring visibility to to that one person. Um, so so two things that you you raised uh, uh, with what you shared is uh, what would be your support system then if you're saying that if you followed your mom advice, maybe you haven't done many crazy <laughs> things in your life. So who who are the people who are your club of craziness who are cheering? <laughs> And you are crazy <laughs> and then think about maybe one failure because a lot of also young women when they see you know uh women like you who are leaders who are accomplished who are successful whose voices heard and taken seriously they think that you know it's all nice and shiny and they know oh they, yeah and they might not think of like no i failed one or two <laughs> at least oh my God. times in my Almost life every day and I picked up myself and I got along. So maybe share with us one or two failures. I've had more than one or two failures. Um, a lot, a lot, honestly. Well, if I successfully publish every single thing I put my hands on, then <laughs> my Wikipedia page will be like 100 pages long. Um, I, I, I once tweeted about, about not getting accepted into something and someone was like, even you to grant command, I'm like, hey, do you know how many rejection letters I get? <laughs> It's, you can't do it all. Um, I have tried and failed. I have tried business-wise. I have tried for a very long time. Let's see. I tried my hands at social media marketing, digital marketing. I'm not a digital marketer, so I'm going to assume that's a failed venture. Um, I was a, an entrepreneur. I used to buy and sell things. That sustained me for a while. I'm not going to lie. That just went down the drain. Um, before I even get into stories that didn't make it um, to to what it is right now, um, I I started. I had like so many great ideas of documenting um, Nigerian um, brands, Nigerian brands called "We Buy Nigerian." 
I just didn't have enough time to dedicate to that. So that's another field venture. Um, <laughs> um, there's so many stories, um, even within Document Women. In fact, there's so many things that I'm like, oh, let's do this. Let's do this. Every day I'm like, let's dedicate some time to documenting this. And I just realized that I don't have like the bandwidth to continue with these. Um, so that that sometimes it's like not com it's not a, it's not complete failure. It's just we will try again. There is still a chance to try again. Unfinished business. <laughs> and yes, it's unfinished business. Great. Um, there's so many stories. In fact, um, I think one significant one that I would have to say out loud is during the NSAS protests. Um, I was so many things. I mean, I was part of the feminist coalition, so I was doing that organizing. I was an actual protester because I've been a victim of police brutality myself as well. So I was out there on the streets. I was a mobilizer. I don't know. I can't remember who gave me that name, but I've, I've it's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> um, I noticed that um, some places weren't having a, as many people protesting and that's not safe because the law enforcement find it easier to pick on those locations and like arrest everybody there. And I noticed that people always wanted to go where like visible people like me, myself were. And so I would choose those past locations and just like go there every day. And even as a safety measure for myself, I would not repeat one location. So you cannot like come find me the next day at the same location. So I was doing all of that. And let's not forget that I'm actually a journalist, which is my number one job. Um, so I have like all these footages, all these pictures that I took, all of these stories that I was going to tell and my mental health like went to complete shreds. Um, I even, I told you about how tech was very important to what we did. Um, I learned from my colleague um, how to use Notion. And then I set up a, a, a database to to match missing people. This was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. So it's no, it's no um surprise that I I wasn't able to finish. Um, I set up a database to to match like missing people, tweets and missing people messages on Facebook posts with people um that were found in hospitals and corpses that were found, and so because I had had people. Um, we had people sending us pictures like we found this corpse. We don't know the owner. We're looking for the family. Um, and we'll try to put trigger warning and post, but it was a lot. I was like, well, we've been using technology to our advantage. Maybe this is one of the ways that we can. And so we try to match. Okay, we have this number of missing people, and we have this number of found people. Which one might they be? <laughs> Um, I was working with, we're only two people working on that project. Um, myself and another uh, assistant, she quit, obviously. Um, and shortly after, I quit. I was like, no, I cannot wake up in the morning and start scrolling through pictures of corpses. Um, and then messages of families crying, looking for their family members. That was the most horrifying part of like that period for me my mental health went to shreds my safety was in question doing all of that juggling all of that was too much for me and so I handed it over to someone else to do you know looking back to to all of that and and where you are today um how, how do you feel about it you know like uh where the movement was at uh, what did you have to go through the people you lost in the in the fight, you know, and and where you are right now. How do you feel about looking back? I honestly, I'm not sure that I'm done processing. To be honest, if you ask mm. me this question again tomorrow, I'll probably have a different answer. Mm. I just know that um, obviously this is a lifelong scar that we would have to live with, and at the same time, still explain yourself. You know, people forget that there is a human being behind, like, all of this. And the human being is processing a barrage of emotions. Like, we should not have been exposed to that quantity of things to deal with. But, yeah, every day, I don't, not sure, I'm not sure exactly how I feel. 
But every day is also a chance to like process and learn, I guess. Mm. Okay, Kiki, the younger self of you, um, very, very young one, you know, uh, when she was dreaming and she had all this, you know, years coming in her way with so much stuff she wants to do and become, what what would you tell her to to do differently or to continue to do persistently? Okay, um, differently, I will tell her to stop doubting herself. Um, Self-doubt really is limiting. In fact, till now, <laughs> it's limiting. There's so, there, you can go so, so much farther if you just have the audacity of a white man. <laughs> 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 um but yeah um because we weren't we weren't thought of that city in fact the, the 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 people that had it unlearned it because you're a woman what are you doing with all that audacity where are you taking it to um but yeah i will tell her to consistently continue to try new things i think the one thing that I, I i i pride myself in doing was that i was always able to pivot when one thing is not i i just felt like i could do anything um i mean if if the if the if it was in my hands i have the capacity to do anything like tomorrow if i want to be an engineer all i need to do is decide um and so i'll tell her to continue just doing don't be afraid to pivot if this isn't working try something else that's fine um, you can always come back, but you have the capacity to excel and you will excel almost anywhere you find yourself in. You're like a cactus. You will always grow. That's a perfect advice. I'll, I'll take that too. <laughs> Pivoting is not easy, but if you mm -hmm. believe in your capacity, you can definitely do it. So we always ask our guests to, um, if they are Nala and why, and I know you were at the summit, so you know, this whole I am Nala vibe and, and the podcast is I am Nala. So are you Nala? And if yes, why? <laughs> it's basically Kiki, you know? It's it's just like equals. I do, I do. <laughs> I'm not very good at praising myself. I'm shy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I am Nala because I am magic. I am Nala because I am influence. I am Nala because I am pouring back into my society. Beautiful, okay. beautiful. So yeah. Kiki, what's next for you? Well, entrepreneurship is not easy. <laughs> so I'm learning. Entrepreneurship apparently means you have to be so many things. You have to be financial advisor. You have the to CEO, be- The CEO, the CFO, the all yeah, together. The, <laughs> the way you see us, Omar, I'm playing so many roles. Oh. <laughs> It's not that easy. It's such a humbling experience. It's like when you think you've blown and you want to start something else, you're starting from, well, you're starting from experience, um, even though it feels like you're starting from ground zero. So that's where I'm at right now. I enjoy making films and I hope to continue doing the, that. Um, and the world is my oyster, really. It could be any single thing, whatever, like, adventure just pops up on my doorstep. I'm more than excited to go on with it. Thank you so much for being on this episode. Uh, so inspiring. And I learned so much also from you because okay. I love I love storytelling. I did also a, a documentary myself and I, I can relate to so much of what you're saying, but you're so brave and yeah. courageous. And I hope you. uh, young women out there on the continent listening to us will, will take from that courage and pursue what they want and make the word their oyster too. <laughs> so thank you for, for joining us. And to everyone listening to us, please check out nalafem.org slash podcast. And you will find in the notes uh, more about Kiki and where she's at, Document Women, Femco, and other links that you can check out. And we'll see you in the next episode. <laughs> Bye. Bye. To stay updated with our work, go to nalafem.org and sign up to our newsletter. You can also sign our manifesto on nalafem.org slash sign. And you can follow us on social media at nalafem. 
This is your host, Aya Shabi, and see you in the next episode. Um, you will be able to do video or just audio? Oh, my head is a mess. <laughs> listen, listen, a lot of women on the podcast say, oh, my thing is a mess. When I see what the mess they mean, it's like... No, mine is a real mess. <laughs> <laughs>